The Unshackled Waves, episode 42. Hello and welcome to the Unshackled Waves podcast. I'm Tim Wilms, here for another interview show. Our guest for today is Tim Andrews, who is the founder and executive director of the Australian Taxpayers Alliance. It describes itself as a grassroots advocacy and activist organisation dedicated to fighting high taxes, wasteful spending and crippling red tape, and also to be a hub for all those who oppose the big government agenda. They run various campaigns to lobby politicians on issues such as free speech, the nanny state, and bureaucratic waste. They also host the annual Australian Libertarian Society Freedman Conference in Sydney, which The Unshackled is sponsoring this year. About Tim himself, he holds degrees in economics, law, and public policy. He's a former president of the uh, Australian Liberal Students Federation, and before founding the Australian Taxpayers Alliance, worked in the United States at Americans for Tax Reform. So, Tim, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's great to be on, and a huge thank you to the Unshackled for being one of our sponsors for the Friedman Conference. Very much appreciate it. Yeah, uh, I've I've been to every Friedman Conference, so I thought I'd go uh, one up this year and become a sponsor. Excellent. Thank you. Now, I've, I've given a brief overview of the Australian pa- Taxpayers Alliance. Now, you describe, uh, many people would describe you as a lobby group. You sometimes refer to yourselves as a do tank as opposed to a think tank. But in your own words, what does the Australian Taxpayers Alliance set out to achieve and how? Sure. I mean, there are so many groups in Australia that have their hand out for taxpayer money. It seems that every time you know, there's a budget, every time there's a new announcement by the government, you have an entire legion of groups with their hands out saying, give us money, give us money, give us money. Um, yet there's no one out there representing the taxpayers, who are the people who actually have to foot the bill. So we started the Australian Taxpayers Alliance as a way to represent taxpayers and to try and get over the problem of... Um, concentrated benefits, diffuse costs with any sort of government program where you have one very, very vocal lobby group getting money and everyone else has to fit the bill and trying to mobilise those forces. So that was one of the original reasons we started the ACA and the way we describe, the reason we describe ourselves as more of a do tank rather than a think tank is that we don't really engage in grass, in research, but rather we engage in community activism, education. So the analogy that I use is the means of production. So in the economy, you have your raw goods, which become your intermediate goods, which become your consumer goods. In the battle of ideas, you have the same thing. Your raw goods are sort of the ideas that come out of universities, the 100,000 word thesis, sort of academic stuff. These then get converted into your intermediate goods, which is what think tanks do, you know, your 30 page policy paper, your briefings. The consumer goods are what we try and do. We try and distill those 30 page policy things into something that's short, that's one page, that's simple, that the person on the street can understand. So it's the retail, it's the consumer end, that's where our sort of education comes in. So that's one other part of what we do. But we then try and activate and mobilize people. One of the things that we discovered previously was there was no real movement of people in Australia who supported the ideas of liberty and small government. I mean, you could go to an event by a think tank, but there was no sort of community. So, you know, you might angrily shout at your TV or write comments on a blog, but you couldn't feel part of it. And that's one of the reasons why we'd run social events, we run the conference, we run those sort of things to get people involved, to mobilise them, to activate them, to feel that they're part of something bigger. Um, Because, you know, Although we believe in individualism, we still believe in the importance of you know, civil society organisations and communities. And so through those sort of campaigns, and then once we mobilise people, we get them to contact their member of parliament and to provide the sort of incentives that politicians need to do the right thing. Um, politicians like all people respond to incentives. And so if we can try and get the pitchforks out to say that if you don't do this particular thing, then this will cost you at the next election, that changes the incentives of politicians and makes them hopefully more likely to do the right thing. 
Uh, one of the things that yeah, I always say is that it's it's all very well for us to have our like books and policy papers, but we need to uh, transform that into language which is accessible to the public who are not as uh, enthusiastic or interested in politics as we are. Um, one of the ways that you aim to try and shape public opinion is highlighting cases of government waste and largesse. Um, I'm just curious, how do you uncover such cases and uh, do you see them helping to wake, wake up the public who otherwise would just think that the government's just doing the right thing? Sure. I mean, most egregious examples of government waste still are relatively minor in the great scheme of the budget, but they do serve as a demonstration to the public that their taxes aren't being used effectively. When they see horrible examples of waste, that at least demonstrates to them that, hang on, why am I paying taxes for this? So even though, you know, a $40,000 project might not be that great, it still you know, demonstrates the idea to people. Um, it's difficult, unfortunately, in Australia to be able to get this data. Um, freedom of information requests can be complicated, they can be time consuming, and more importantly, if you don't know what questions to ask, you don't know, you don't know what questions to ask, so you don't know what's out there, it's sort of a catch-22 situation. One of the things we've been campaigning on for a couple of years now, and we've seen in the last sort of three weeks, um, Corey Bernardi Malcolm, and Malcolm Roberts come out strongly in favour of this, and previously uh, David, Senator Lionhelm, Senator James McGrath and a few others, has been the idea of transparency portals. Now, the idea behind this is to basically put all government spending up online in an easily searchable, easily accessible, one-stop shop portal. So you can search by department, you can search by cost item, you can search by pretty much anything and can actually start tracking spending because then the, the data is out there for everyone to see. You don't need to trawl through reports, you don't need to go through PD, um, you know, 500 page PDFs, you don't need to put an FOI request, the data is out there. It's worked throughout the US, most US states have one, the US federal government has one, some European countries have one, the city of London has one. Um, and you found, for instance, in Texas, and it cost them about a million dollars to set up. And in the first year, it saved $8.7 million through individuals on the street just finding mistakes. There was one case where someone discovered that duplicate printed toner cartridge contract worth half a million dollars. Two departments were paying for the same contract. No one realized that until someone using this website was able to find this egregious case of waste that was just almost borderline no fraud. Um, so those sort of things, if we can get more of that information out into the public domain, then rather than just having the ATA or experts or the media trying to find this data, you open it up to the tens of thousands of citizen auditors who'll be out there pouring through the books, highlighting waste and drawing attention to it. So that's one of our big campaigns that we've done a lot of work on and we hope we'll be able to get some more positive traction on. Yeah, if the, if the public was able to, on a daily basis, look at uh, what government departments were, were spending, that would really ramp up the pressure on the politicians. But it, yeah, it sounds like that uh, freedom of information, it sounds easy to do, but as, you, as you've said, it's, it's not quite as easy as a lot of us would think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Now, uh, shaping uh, public opinion is one thing, but obviously it's the politicians who make the laws of the land. So are you able to shed any light on the art of lobbying politicians who are often so risk adverse? Um, to, uh, how do you convince them to support your public policy goals? Sure. And look, I mean, I technically should note we are a non-profit advocacy group. We're not lobbyists. We're not registered as lobbyists. We try and, you know, convince and educate politicians of the benefits of certain bills. But tech, I, I do want to stress we're not technically lobbyists. Yeah. We're not guns for hire, etc. Yeah. Um, there's sort of, it, it depends on who you're talking to. There are quite a few politicians in Parliament who are ideologically solid, who actually believe in these ideas. So it's a question of just informing them of a particular issue, but also particularly if they're members of the government or the opposition, like members of a major party, showing them that if they go out on a limb on something, that they'll have public support. If you go out and say something, you know, let's cut this wasteful spending, you'll get shouted down by the dozen left, two dozen, three dozen left wing groups. And so politicians become risk averse, they become scared because they don't want criticism. So one of the things we try and do is get that public support on the other side of the equation to actually demonstrate that you're do they're, if they're doing the right thing. So it's, it's a question of providing the incentives once again. And even if 
they might not be ideologically on board on an issue. If they have 5,000 people emailing them from their electorate saying, I care about this issue, particularly if they're from a marginal, like, well, if not, even not 5,000, like, if you're in a marginal electorate, a couple of hundred votes in the balance, and you get a couple of hundred people emailing you saying, this is a vote moving issue for me, you better act. You're looking at the next election and you're thinking, well, mm, I, I, I have to do what my constituents want. So with a number of other politicians, it's simply a question of trying to incentivize them to do the right thing. Um, you know, if you're if you're a weather vane who doesn't believe in anything, it's a terrible thing for you personally. But if the winds, if we make sure the wind's blowing in the right direction, then at least the politicians will follow suit. So it's more, uh, 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 I won't use the word loving, but uh, uh, meeting the politicians and convincing them, that's the, the final step. You've got to uh, create, yeah. uh, make sure that, you know, you've got, say, signatures or emails to them to show, look, this is what the, the public uh, are thinking. You know, you need to pay attention. Absolutely, yes. So it's, it's the two sort of strong there are two, two prong solutions. The first is getting the public support, getting the traction. And then when you meet the politicians, you can tell them, look, you need to act on this, otherwise you'll have the pitchforks outside your office and you'll lose the next, your seat at the next election and you don't want to be unemployed. Politicians don't want to lose their jobs, so um, they quite like their jobs. So showing them that that is the way forward. Um, and that's why a lot of the left-wing groups are so successful, because they've just got such a huge, mobilised, well-funded, well-resourced campaign that does this. We're still growing. Yeah, uh, it's, de it's definitely... Uh, you can definitely use politicians, it sounds like you can use politicians' weaknesses to your advantage. Yeah. And I mean, th and that's the thing, you don't want to go at someone purely with this sort of libertarian or classical liberal ideological approach, because that might work with some of the good ideological politicians, but it's not going to work for the remainder. Most politicians might have leanings and sympathies in one direction, but they're not strong ideological warriors. So for them, you need to find how to best get what they're interested in, what their outcomes are, and frame the argument in an appropriate manner. So for those who think that uh, sending an email to an MP or signing a petition uh, doesn't do anything, then please reconsider and if, no, you absolutely. See, yeah, if you see a campaign that you feel strongly about, make sure you sign it. Look, particularly contacting your MP, um, that's better than signing a petition because contacting the MP, you know, they get a reminder on every couple of days, particularly um, if you can edit pro forma text, that's the best way. So rather than just sending in a, a standard pro, like all of our campaigns, we urge people, we have a pro forma text, we urge people to edit them because the more personal it is, the more likely it is to be responded to because it seems genuine. Now let's turn to some of the uh, specific uh, issues that you campaign on. Now one of uh, your uh, offshoots is My Choice Australia, which is campaigning against the, the nanny state. Now there is this disconnect in Australia. There's this stereotype that Australians love a good time and night out a few drinks, yet we have some of the most draconian nanny state laws uh, in the Western world. So why do the Some of? I think we've got the most. Yeah, oh, the most anywhere in the world. What do I mean in the Western world? I was drink. I was out at bars in the Middle East two weeks ago. I was on a stopover. I was in Dubai and I was in Abu Dhabi, and I could drink a lot more freely than I could in Sydney. Okay, I'll, I'll rephrase the question. Why do we have the worst? Um, yeah. Look, I actually think paradoxically, it is because it is big because Australians believe we are the rugged individualists, the Ned Kellys, the sort of that spirit of Australia. And because we have this public conception of ourselves, that people can get away with creating this entire draconian situation. So I actually think paradoxically that self-image is the problem. But the second reason is the Australian public health lobby is so well funded, so well resourced. They've been the most professional, I think, out of any country. The UK probably comes second. We've got tens of millions of dollars every year being spent to lobby governments to put them in any state restrictions. They have an whole industry that depends on this. There's a centre in Western Australia that does that receives taxpayers, that's received a lot of taxpayer money, and all it does is train more people as to how to lobby governments for more nanny state restrictions. It doesn't even lobby itself for nanny state restrictions. It teaches people how to lobby for nanny state restrictions. Um, the amount of money going through all of these organisations is staggering and it's paid for by our taxpayer dollars. And when you've got an entire industry dependent on them getting funding, calling for further restrictions, what are they going to do? They're going to call for further restrictions. And then you get further restrictions. And then you have more people studying these things at university. 
they've got nothing to do with their lives because they have no marketable skills in the workplace. The only thing to do is call for more regulations to ensure that they're kept in a job. And so the cycle continues and it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. It's, it's shocking. Like, as I said, I was at a conference in Europe um, where you know, the drinking culture is normal. There's no problems. You know, I could go into a bar without worrying about bouncers and being interrogated, things like that. I was in Abu Dhabi and Dubai and the sort of stopovers. Could come to a bar, there were no problems. Sydney, Sydney, it's ridiculous and it's kind of productive. The evidence is very, very clear. Like alcohol related violence is what everyone talks about. But the evidence is very, very clear. Alcohol doesn't actually cause violence. Um, that's why countries throughout continental Europe don't have any alcohol related violence, they have virtually no alcohol related violence. The reason, the things that cause alcohol related violence are primarily that we have a political culture where politicians and the media go and tell everyone, if you drink, you will get violent, if you drink, you will get violent, if you drink, you will get violent, if you drink, you will get violent. So it creates a social license for people to get, drink and get violent because that's the, how they're psychologically being primed to do. If you normalize behaviors like drinking, you don't have those restrictions. It's not a taboo other type of thing, then you wouldn't have any of the problems that we're seeing in Australia. Uh, there's, I've also heard the argument that uh, th those who do commit drunken violence, they're already predisposed to violence just just normally, and so. But it's just it's just they they drink, and because it's because it's they're on alcohol at the time. That's why people blame the alcohol. Yeah, or other and other illicit substances and things like that as well. But. Yeah, look, the, the, as the evidence, I think, is quite clear that alcohol itself isn't the problem. I think we should definitely treat people who conduct, who people who are violent, they need to, you know, lock them up, you know, make penalties. It was ridiculous that up until recently in New South Wales, alcohol was a mitigating factor in criminal cases um, for assault and things. Like, that was absolutely disgraceful because it just gives you more of an incentive to engage in poor behaviour. Um, if anything... I'd say have make alcohol an aggravating factor, start making, using the criminal justice system properly and target the guilty and target the problematic elements of the community rather than targeting the innocent. Because at the moment, all the only people who are being penalised are the innocent. Yeah, that's, that's definitely true. The thing that really opened my eyes to how draconian Australia was, because well, I don't spend much time uh, overseas, is I had a conversation with uh, a Belgian citizen who'd, spent, who'd worked in Australia for uh, a few years and he he was just gobsmacked by yeah, the main uh, irritation for him was our traffic laws and and the police and he was just I couldn't just believe how how draconian all the fines and penalties are and uh, he asked me like how do you tolerate this and my, my sort of opinion was well we are it's just sort of normal to me I don't think that there's anything uh, strange about it which is yeah. Which... I mean, oh, look, the fines and the revenues that the government relies on is ridiculous because the government has realised, the Australian government have realised very, very, um, have realized that if you, if you increase taxes, then everyone doesn't like them. So they just increase fines, they increase levies, they increase rates, they increase everything that they don't call a tax and they build the revenue that way, um, which is horrendous. But it's the reason why we don't notice it as well is it's the, uh, the old story being a boiling a frog, right? Although technically that's not true. If you boil a frog, it will slowly, will actually jump out of the pot. But the idea behind that is it's just happened so gradually that people just become, don't actually realise just how far it's become. And it really is an eye-opening experience going overseas and realising just what a, a backwards country we are in this regard. Yeah, that's what really opened my eyes, this conversation that, wow, we've just been conditioned over the years to just accept this uh, co a constant encroachment in our personal lives. Yeah, absolutely. Now, the Taxpayers Alliance is probably one of the um, closest major organisations we have that is purely uh, libertarian in nature, that you try to be as inclusive uh, as, as possible. Now, we often lament the fact that uh, we're still nowhere near close to a libertarian society or here or anywhere else, um, but there's a lot of arguing in libertarian circles about how can we progress the movement? Um, how do you see the current state of the libertarian movement? Well, clearly we do, we're not in libertopia yet, so there's a long way to go. Um, I think the Australian libertarian movement is growing. I think it's still a burgeoning movement um, because we haven't really had a movement for much of the in, in recent years. And you had the old Workers' Party movement, but in the sort of intervening years, there hasn't been that much of a movement outside of think tanks. Um, 
And as movements grow, there are obviously disagreements about strategy. But I think the most important thing is to realise that even if we might disagree on some minor policy issue, even if we disagree that the specific nature of a particular proposal, that it's important for us to actually work together because there aren't that very many of us in Australia. And people who disagree with us on 5% of the issues aren't the enemy. It's the people who want to increase the size of government that are the enemy, which is why we always take a very big tent approach. So whether or not you're, as long as you, on the, as long as on the issues that matter to you most, you want to reduce the size of government and you want to be left alone, then I think you're a friend and I'd like to work with you. Yeah, it's, I, I find the, the constant uh, Facebook discussions uh, qu uh, quite uh, quite pointless and time wasting. Uh, I don't I don't engage with them because I'm f focused on you know sure. trying trying to get the 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 message out to f other people rather than absolutely. And that. I think that's the right thing to do because there's I mean arguing amongst yourselves might be fun, but it ends up convincing no one. Uh, Minicism versus anarchism is probably the one of the most pointless uh, mm -hmm. debates in, in our current in the current state of the world. Yes, I agree. I mean, look, it can be a fun intellectual debate. Like, if you want to go and have a fun debate over a drink with someone, that's fine. But you need to realise that at the end of the that, if you if that, for that debate to be serious, we need to be you know thirty years down the track in Libertopia, and then we can talk about the exact model that we want to use. It's not fruitful at the moment. Like, it's echo chamber talking amongst ourselves rather than. The the new term is actually not Libertopia. It's Ankapistan. And can I say yes, yes, no? I've, I've, I've seen, I've, I've, I've seen the Facebook groups. <laughs> now, um, you talked about how we need a big tent approach, but a point of contention for many libertarians and those on the right, uh, myself included, is the the concept of outreach to the left. Now, I believe that it's it's quite dangerous to work with people who deep down don't believe in individual freedom and will try and throw you under the bus the first opportunity uh, they get. Do you still believe that there is a case for outreach to the left? Look, um, the problem is that can people who are more conservative generally start with the principle that liberty is good except in the areas that they disagree with, whereas people on the left believe that liberty is terrible except on the issues that they want to be left free on. So you're automatically starting with a much worse position with the left because their de facto position is that small government is bad and they want to increase the size of government, which it makes outreach very, very, very difficult to the left. Um, you, I don't, I think that the people who have argued for the sort of libertarianism, as it's called in the US, the sort of libertarians for Obama, the Will Wilkinsons of the world, they keep arguing this and I think it's never worked. I think that outreach to the left as an ideological sort of this is where we need to go. I don't think it's ever worked historically. I don't think it ever will work. Having said that, though, there are specific policy areas where there can be common ground between the right and the left um, or between libertarians and the left on a particular policy issue. And I'm very happy to work with them on a particular policy issue. Um, my personal opinion, and again, look, I think liberal libertarians are part of the libertarian tent, but I think on, I personally, and I'm happy to work with them, but personally I don't agree with them on strategy, and I think that any libertarian who seems to think that they'll be able to convince the left to somehow like small government, I think that's a naive view. And quite a few people have, and, it, and it's interesting that um, I, there was a recent post by one of the former sort of higher people in Students for Liberty. Um, in the US wrote a, a post saying, you know, for the last sort of five years of my life, I've dedicated it to trying to work with left wing groups, trying to get them to become libertarian. And I've realized, wow, I wasted five years of my life. It's never going to happen. Uh, they're never going to come on board. Um, and it's a hopeless cause. The, the way the conversations tend to go from my experience, because contrary to what a lot of people think, like I've been in the liberty movement for seven years, I did try outreach to the left in mm. to my early years, so I, I have tried, but it always goes that, you know, oh, you say to the left, oh, you like these things, oh, you like this, you like this, uh, oh, what about this? And they're like, oh, that's terrible, like, I, there's no way I can possibly work with you, that's just evil, and then that's where the alliance tends to end, so yes. that, that's why... That's why I find it so frustrating. No, I agree with you. I wish it was different, but I think that, in, and, and I think that 
generally people keep trying the outreach to the left and then they get hit by reality and realize it just doesn't work. It sort of seems that it's it's easier to outreach to conservatives at the moment because they're they're the ones being targeted by the government these days yes. and so yeah it's you can always make the case to them like you know obviously you believe that uh you know this is the proper way to live but look at look at what the government's uh, doing to you isn't it better to have just a libertarian approach where you know you're at least going to be left alone and i mean this this was the argument that um fs meyer used when he coined the term fusionism most people seem to misunderstand fusionism and they think that fusionism is a strategic alliance between libertarians and conservatives it's not and um, what Meyer was on about is that libertarians and conservatives need each other because is the only way to have a virtuous society that can traditional conservatives want is to have a small government because government is in the way of virtue. But sim and so in order, if you believe, you can't compel virtue from the power of a gun, firstly, but secondly, government will never be in a position to instill conservative values because just look at governments all around the world. But similarly, that libertarians need to remember the value of civil society and institutions that when we get have a small government there needs to be something to fill that space which is your civil society your voluntary organizations your institutions your groups that look after people so it's a sort of symbiotic relationship between traditional conservatives and libertarians and i really quite like that that approach that's very much my personal ideology uh, but I should also stress that yes, like conservatives have done uh, bad things uh, in, in government in the past. I mean, the the George W. Bush administration was was an example of big government conservatism uh, gone bad. So, uh, f oh, for me personally, I'm not a complete apologist for conservatives. Sure, and well, look, especially I think the neoconservative movement, I have a lot of issues with. But then I'd argue that they're not really conservatives. Yeah. Oh, that's a whole nother topic. Now, yes. another uh, point of debate among libertarians is the, the meaning of free speech. Now, many believe that free speech only means that the government uh, cannot censor what you say, but it's it's got nothing to do with uh, libertarianism if a corporation fires you or your business is boycotted or your access to social media is denied if you say something others don't like. I've always maintained that such a society still wouldn't be very free and an open one. Uh, so that's why there's been this new concept of cultural libertarianism. Uh, where do you stand on this free speech debate? Um, I regret in some ways that we use the word free speech to mean two different things because there are two different approaches to this. Free speech, I think, in terms of the government, we can all agree on. You know, government censorship is bad. When it comes down to cultural issues of free speech, I would prefer that there's a different term to use. I just haven't come up with it because it is a different issue, right? It's not an issue of government involvement and a lot of libertarians are sort of you know, narrow, this issue of government. I think generally what's happening with the shutting down of speech and people being penalised for speaking their mind, I mean, we keep seeing it. I think it's terrible for society. I think it's a genuinely bad outcome. I think it's a much worse world if people are scared to speak. I mean, speaking practically, if you're fired from your job because of something you said and you're fired because of the government or if you're fired because you violated a social taboo and you had the Twitter lynch mobs after you, at the end of the day, you're still fired. Right? So that's why it's, it's an issue. Now, while it's not strictly libertarian to discuss the second of these, whether because it's a voluntary transaction, the government's not involved, it's a private corporation, they can do what they want. So it's not purely a libertarian issue. I think it's bad from a societal perspective a situation where people are afraid to speak out. I think that's just bad from a society, from society's perspective. And I think that's something we should speak out about. But I wouldn't necessarily, even though the effects can be very similar, as I mentioned, it's still different to government censorship from that purist libertarian perspective. So yes, I think it's something that we can personally oppose and you know fight against and oppose and say this is bad for a society. But I but it is still one step removed from government speech censorship, which is the purest libertarian position. Yeah, I, I definitely understand that. And, 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 that, and that's why I, and that's and that's why I think that 
I don't like the fact that we use the word free speech to describe both of these because they are different to some degree. Um, but yeah, look, I agree that I agree to some degree with the cultural libertarian movement, but, but like having said that, the fact that you have a right to be a dick doesn't actually mean you should exercise that right constantly. Like some of the cultural libertarians, personally, I think they might go a little bit too far, but they should still be allowed to speak what they want. That's just my personal opinion. Uh, I, I prefer the term, as I said before, the, the open society, I think. Maybe how does that yes. term, t term sound? That's a good sound. I, I like the term the open society. And, um, I think I, we should be, yeah, that's a good one. Because I do think it's still uh, a conversation libertarians should be involved in. Like, uh, obviously, like, when people are deliberately, like, being a dick, that's obviously, uh, you know, no, uh, nobody's really, you know, going to say that they shouldn't be criticised for it. But, for example, the, you know, Cooper's Brewery uh, Bible Society debate, I mean, that's an example of that. <laughs> that had that's, nothing to do with that government. That was insane. That was insane. Yeah. Look, what happened there was insane. But the problem is that corporations and people on the right just give in constantly. Like Cooper's gave in. Everyone else gives in, which is completely emboldens the people on the left, because, culturally at least, because they know they're going to get a scalp. Why did like the reason why Trump was so successful in many ways was he didn't buckle to the demands. People actually need to start growing a backbone and realize it'll work for them. And, if they actually stand up for their principles. Uh, yeah, but the, uh, the the point, the reason why I raised it is that that entire episode had nothing to do with with government. I mean, there was no there was no government uh, interference with Coopers at all. They 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 felt felt just by you know uh, people on social media sure. uh, bullying them that they had to curtail what that what they believed. But I think that there is, and, and, and but I think, and I think the response to that should be that people on social media from the other side should step up their game. Um, it's it's difficult because I don't think there's necessary libertarian position on it. But I think there's a position as normal, decent human beings who are not insane. We should value freedom of speech and oppose actions like what occurred with Coopers. And I even, I also think, even left-wing people uh, shouldn't be uh, fired from their jobs if they say something uh, outra uh, outrageous from my point of view. I mean, there was the case a few years back of uh, this SBS sports reporter being uh, fired because he said something against the Anzacs. And my point was, like, yes, what he said, you know, wasn't, wasn't very nice, but he was a sports reporter. Like, it was nothing to do with what he said. I know. Yes. Now, uh, let's turn to um, uh, uh, world issues now. Now, you've been uh, quite sceptical of the Trump movement, am, am I correct? Yeah, I think sceptical is a good word. I mean, yeah. I've certainly praised them when they've done something good. But overall, I think scepticism is a good word. Now, uh, you actually have US voting rights and you voted for the libertarian candidate, Gary Johnson. Uh, you've, you've Through gritted teeth. Yeah. Uh, you've maintained your scepticism of Trump into his presidency. Uh, so what's wrong with, with Trump in your view and how do you rate his performance so far? Look, credit where credit is due. He's certainly, I like a number of his appointments, in particular his Supreme Court nomination. I think the Supreme Court nomination is probably the best thing that's come out of his administration so far. But in terms of regulations, in terms of uh, you know, energy, the environment, just sort of business regulations in general. That's been very promising. He said a lot of very, very promising things early on about FDA reform and drug administration, although his appointments there don't seem to have been as good as his rhetoric, which is unfortunate. I like the fact that he doesn't want to start World War Three with Russia. Yeah, that um, was good. Like not having World War Three looming on the agenda is probably a good thing because um, the comments from especially the Hillary camps and the Republicans there were just crazy. This is not to necessarily defend Russia, I'm not a Putin fan, but I, I think the aggression, some of the aggression there had severe geopolitical you know, challenges, problems that, you know, we don't want nuclear war with Russia, like that's a bad outcome. And I think Trump would be better there. Um, my concerns are that, first of all, he's had a track record his entire life of being quite left wing, and I'm not necessarily sure that his conversion is genuine. The fact that 
on, he's supported socialised medicine in the past, and given the abysmal failure of his attempt to repeal Obamacare, um, single, you know, socialised, full socialised medicine is now on the agenda in the US is a problem. I think there's clearly been a problem with just thinking through an internal discipline in his administration. The haphazard way and just the ill thought out way that the original immigration restrictions were put in, I, I think is symptomatic of that. I think that they might have had some good intention, but that the, the, the executive orders were just drafted so poorly that you know a bit more time and thought would have been beneficial. The biggest problem, of course, is I'm, I don't believe in protectionism. I think protectionism has failed everywhere and any sort of new trade deals so any new trade restrictions that Trump wants to bring in, where he's pretty much of the Bernie, of the same view as Bernie Sanders, will be quite damaging to the U.S. economy. Now, if he able, if he's able to cut regulation enough, cut labour market regulation, cut taxes as he wants to, it'll make it more of a moot point, because um, companies won't need to flee the U.S. But any sort of trade, like I'm worried about returns to trade wars and the damage that will cause the international economy. That's one of my big ones. Um, yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree with those uh, criticisms. I'm often accused of being a mindless uh, cheerleader for, for Trump, but my, my position has always been on, on, on the issues that were prominent in 2016. He was the best candidate on them, on uh, immigration, and yeah, especially, you know, not having a uh, nu nuclear war. Uh, but having having said having said that, um, you know, I just couldn't stand the you know people who thought you know he was Hitler. I thought that was just uh, completely overblown. But I also yeah I do I do agree that um, yeah on on economics he's not a solid free market person. But he does seem to be adopting the traditional Republican uh, free market platform, like with tax cuts and business regulation. So even though he doesn't really believe that personally, he's still he's he's still going to implement what is the traditional Republican agenda on that. We hope so, yes. And he has surrounded himself with some good advice. It's like when you have someone like Art Laffer working on your campaign, that's pretty, or at least advising in some capacity, that's pretty good. So look, I'm I'm hoping that my scepticism will be unfounded and then we'll end up having a good administration. And as I said, I'd like to think that, I mean, you, you've seen me on Facebook that I do occasionally praise Trump when he does something good. I try to be fairly fair about it. Um, um, and look, we'll have to see. I mean, the, the best argument in favour of Trump, I think, and this is um, this is the uh, this is why Helen, my wife, uh, supported Trump, was that we're in a situation where even if you know you get the perfect policy wonkiness president, in 15 years you're still going to see an increase in the size of government because the trajectory is just unstoppable. And so the only argument you have, the only chance you throw the dice, blow everything up and hope for the best because there's no other outcome. Because like you put in the best person as president, otherwise it would still be business as usual. So there's the capture of the institutions. Now, that's an argument that I think is a good argument. And that's an argument I understand. It's not necessarily, however, an argument I agree with because Ironically, I, it's it's not a particularly conservative argument, right? Like it's the it's the same argument that you use. Well, let's just blow up the French monarchy, and then you end, which the classical liberals did, and then you end up with the reign of terror, which was even worse. Um, not that I'm comparing Trump to like the reign of terror. I'm just using this as an <laughs> example of the argument. So I, I don't believe that Trump is Hitler. Um, the con the other con the con but that that's why I'm skeptical of that argument. I'm a bit more conservative about things. But that's like that's also a really good argument for Trump that I respect intellectually, even though I'm not necessarily on board with it myself. And as I said, I did vote for Gary Johnson through gritted teeth. I think Gary did everything in his power to alienate me. I think that there was probably no worse campaign that could have been run. Like, um, it's just mind blowing just how terrible that campaign was. But uh, anyway. Uh, I think Trump summed it up, uh, you know, the reason to vote for him pretty well. He said, you know, what do you have to lose? I mean, that's how a lot of libertarians yes. feel. We're, we're, we're constantly in despair. And especially what I what I especially enjoyed about his campaign was how he just slayed establishment people. Like Jeb Bush, who was supposed to be the, the chosen one, just fell apart. 
Yeah, well, I never thought it would be Jeb Bush, but then again, I thought it would be Scott Walker, and he was the first person to fall apart out, so who, what do I know? <laughs> um, look, you, look, you're right, and we'll have to see what happens. And one of the things I appreciate that you do is that I know you aren't just an uncritical Trump drone, but I would caution, like, I think what's important for libertarians who support Trump is, like, do realise when he's wrong on something. Like, there are some form of, you know, some libertarians I see on Facebook who are Trump can never do any wrong. And that's clearly not the case. Like, we should try and get away from the tribal mentality of he's our guy, that we can do no wrong, because the only way we can have a good outcome is if we can hold him accountable. Yeah, I mean, he's he's still doing, uh, from my perspective, a lot of things wrong in, in foreign policy and isn't uh, and isn't being as non-interventionist as promised. Mm. But they're always giving the uh, giving the big tick for not going into nuclear war. I think uh, that's yes, plus. yes. Well, well, he, we, we've still got we've still got three and a half years, but so far no nuclear war. Thumbs up. Yep, check check that box. Now, uh, one of the things that a lot of people liked about Trump is, uh, like I said bef before, he destroyed the professional political class, the, the career politicians, the consultants and the lobbyists, a lot of them you know, riding the so-called gravy train, and a lot of people would include people like you in that. So what, what do you sort of say to people who accuse you of sort of being part of the problem with politics? Oh, I wish I wish there would be a situation where people like me would be unnecessary. Like the perfect situation would be I'd have no job to do. But until that comes, I don't think. Um, I, I I still think that we need some people who are involved in politics to try and keep politicians honest and do the things that we do. Once we're in a situation where my job is no longer necessary, I would love to go and do something else. Because but uh, and look, Trump hasn't destroyed the lobbying class. Like that's that's simply not true. The re when Trump's campaign started doing well was when he actually brought in all the professional campaign teams. Like, that's actually one of the myths of the campaign. It was when Trump was doing poorly that he did, and then he sort of brought in all the professional campaigners. And the same as all the lobbyists are still there, all the people are still there. The gravy train hasn't been destroyed. So uh, I, I think it's a little bit premature to go and talk about the deaths of the gravy train because. They're all still there. The lobbyists are still there. The revolving door between Goldman Sachs and the government is still there. I don't think we've seen that much of a change yet, despite his rhetoric. So that's but to your original point, um, I, 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 I don't necessarily think I'm part of the problem. But you know, that's the, people can always think that. But I, but I certainly do agree that a world where my job is made redundant will be a much better world. So, so you'd love to do what Nigel Farage has done. I mean, he spent his entire political career uh, campaigning against the EU, and once Brexit passed, he said, "Right, that's it. My work's done. I'm going to yeah. do something else." Yeah, absolutely. So that's, absolutely. That's definitely something far more fun and stressful. Yes, absolutely. Well, well, that's something of we all we all wish one day will will happen. We we do we do all dream of what is it, Libertopia or Ankabistan or. Uh, no, we won't have to rage about uh, everything. Maybe, maybe one day. Maybe one day, and maybe, or maybe you can just do what you know some people have done and just leave and go and live in your own little paradise somewhere in the middle of nowhere without any government. Uh, but I'm not uh, yeah. quite that defeatist yet. No, uh, that, that's quite delusional in in my point of view. I don't, I don't want to live in my own uh, libertarian world, pretending that the, the outside world doesn't exist. No, no nor do I. Well, it's been great chatting with you, Tim. So thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to come and talk with us. Thank you for the opportunity. And of course, I would advise all of our listeners to go and check out the work of the Australian Taxpayers Alliance and its current campaigns. Uh, as I said before, uh, send a letter to your MP or, or sign a position petition. We mentioned one of their uh, offshoots, My Choice Australia Against the Nanny State. They always have Free Speech Australia as well, which, uh, as the name suggests, campaigns for more free speech. I'll provide a link in the description to those uh, campaigns, and I'll also uh, provide a... Link. THR Now, which is our current... Oh, t and check out THR Now, which is our current campaign to legalise vaping in Australia. I'll also put that in the description as plug. well. And also, I would encourage everyone to purchase tickets to the, the Freedman Conference. Tickets are still available, aren't they? Yep. Yep, absolutely. So we'll provide a link to that in the description as well. So please book uh, so you don't miss out. And uh, like I said at the beginning, the Unshackled will be there. It's always a, a fun experience. You get to not only get to listen to great speakers, uh, but also get to uh, meet people from all over the country. I always, when I, when I first uh, went to it, it was like being on school camp. It was tons of fun. 
Yeah, it's a lot of fun. I encourage everyone. And I think um, the Unshackled listeners can uh, can get a discount code. We gave you a coupon code, yep, I believe. Yeah, Unsh- Unshackled. So. so I'll provide a link to that coupon code Excellent. in the where you can get a discount as well. All Great. right. All right, so that's the show for today. So, of course, uh, to our listeners, don't forget, if you haven't already, sign up to the email list at theunshackled.net slash subscribe. Uh, Also, consider supporting The Unshackled at theunshackled.net slash support. And, of course, don't forget to subscribe to the show on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, or view the video version on YouTube. And, of course, don't forget to keep checking theunshackled.net on a regular basis for all the latest news. Thanks once again for listening, and we'll see you next time.